Hello, this is Astrology Hotline. I'm Kyle Pierce, and this is the forecast for January 23rd through January 29th, 2023. I'm going to be doing a little bit of an overview of the transits for the week ahead, as well as a little bit of a focus on what I would consider the maybe main signatures of the week. And then I'll wrap up with sort of a daily weather report uh, using the planetary days as our guide. So I hope you all had a good week last week. Hopefully survived the Saturn-Venus conjunction uh, without too much heartache. Um, We are uh, not exactly out of the woods with uh, Venus-Saturn. It's it's, uh, still pretty tight as we get the week started with Venus uh, just barely beginning to separate from Saturn. Um, So for the first half of the week, it's, you know, still going to feel pretty Venus-Saturn, basically until... Venus leaves Aquarius because they're uh, together right there at about that last five or so degrees of Aquarius. I'm not going to spend as much time with Venus Saturn uh, this week. If you want to know a little more about that, you can listen to last week's forecast where I talked about that a little more extensively because this week I want to focus on uh, something a little more pleasant, something um, a little more Venus in Pisces as Venus will be ingressing into Pisces uh, rather conveniently um, on Friday, uh, the day of Venus, January 27th. So will likely be a, a very welcome relief post uh, Venus Saturn uh, as it's a, a very, very different and much more delicious kind of flavor. <laughs> um, I'm also going to focus a little bit on something that will be just uh, beginning uh, at the end of the week. We'll pretty much start Sunday, January 29th. Um, We'll talk a bit about Saturn uh, in Aquarius making a a helical setting. As Sunday, the sun will be at about 9 degrees, making its way to 10, with Saturn uh, at about 25 degrees of Aquarius. And that means that uh, Saturn is entering that 15 degree zone near the sun where it will start to uh, dive, in a sense, underneath the sun's beams, essentially closing out uh, Saturn's synodic cycle, uh, eventually with the conjunction, which won't happen for a couple weeks yet. But given that there are several things I want to talk about next week, I kind of want to cover cover this a little more this week. Because otherwise, other than Venus ingressing into Pisces, there is a, kind of a lack of significant developments, if you will, this week. Uh, There aren't really any aspects coming to perfection. There are a couple, which uh, I'll mention, but Venus and Pisces is probably the most uh, significant development this week, as well as Saturn uh, making its helical set. So let's talk about Venus in Pisces. So there are a couple of reasons to rejoice over Venus ingressing into into Pisces, <clears throat> there is, you know, a factor or two that uh, makes this a little less awesome than it, it could be, but certainly it's a very substantial improvement over Venus Saturn. Uh, as much as uh, there are many virtues to Venus Saturn combinations and uh, many useful applications, uh, in terms of the experiential quality uh We definitely like Venus and Pisces a lot more. Uh, Why do we like Venus and Pisces? Well, generally, we like Venus and Pisces because Venus really likes Pisces. And Venus is a a benefic planet. So when Venus is happy, there is often a substantial amount of uh, Venusian works and treats uh, (laughs) available for the the taking, which would include, but not be limited to... um, Things like love, you know, um, beautiful things, harmonious things, things that combine together well. You know, that is uh, Venus's sphere, and she's quite good at uh, combining human beings together in a harmonious way as well uh, to bring people together in a mutually pleasurable and often beneficial uh, Congress. Uh, Venus also tends to be a general wealth indicator as she 
of the the two benefic planets is a little more materially oriented. Uh, her job is to redeem the material world in a sense by uh, introducing those elements of it that uh, bring pleasure, you know, like tasty food, fun games, you know, cool CDs, uh, music, you know, things like that, as well as the uh, the means by which we obtain those things, uh, aka money. Uh, yeah. Where was it going there? Uh, essentially, all those things that represent joy and pleasure that can be experienced in a, a more physical and embodied kind of way, uh, Venus is responsible for. And Venus is said to be especially good at her job in the sign of Pisces. Uh, Pisces is said to be the sign of Venus's exaltation. Exaltation being, a, you know, a state of uh, supreme happiness in one sense or being elevated or, or held up high high in esteem even or being worthy of receiving praise perhaps uh or i should say it, planets in exaltation aren't um morally or objectively superior to planets in other signs but they do tend to produce they do tend to produce effects which are uh, generally experienced uh, subjectively as, as more positive. And uh, those signs for any given planet tend to bring out something of a more idealized version of the planet, a sort of refined and balanced version, if you will. So uh, something that doesn't always happen with a, a planet um, in one of its own signs you know, a planet being um, super empowered and having total control and access to all of its um, resources and <clears throat> significations while uh, tending to be more positive, especially for a planet like Venus, um, can often lead to quite a bit of excess uh, and can sometimes lead to some of those qualities which uh, can be like a little overpowering sometimes or just sometimes too much of a good thing you know often uh even as individuals you know when we are completely empowered to do whatever we want uh, you know we aren't always um you know sometimes we can get results which aren't always good um good for the person or good for other people you know so it may be useful to ask why is venus considered to be exalted in Pisces. Uh, what is it about Pisces that brings out the quote-unquote best in Venus, of Venus? And the answer to that really has as much to do with the archetypal qualities of Venus that are tamped down or not facilitated as much as it has to do with those that um, Pisces supports. <clears throat> so while uh, Pisces being a, a water sign, right, certainly supports Venus's general agenda to create supportive, fulfilling, and enjoyable connections between people, especially with it being, you know, Jupiter-ruled water, more benevolent, uh, it's a benevolent kind of water. <laughs> and... Um, Venus, though, you know, she doesn't uh, officially rule a water sign. Um, she is traditionally assigned a, uh, she has triplicity dignity in water signs, in part because water uh, as an element is uh, nocturnal by nature. And Venus is a nocturnal planet or part of the <clears throat> nocturnal sect of planets. And water as an element tends to facilitate connection, right? But also softens to some degree, makes things a little more pliable, and it tends to conform to whatever container it finds itself in, which naturally resonates with Venus, as you can imagine. Uh, Venus likes to find accord, likes to bring about states of, of agreement, and water is pretty easy to be made agreeable. All you have to do is uh, put it in something it's a little more solid than itself. Water is also the uh, the universal solvent, right? So 
if you put two different substances in water over time, those substances will be broken down and will be combined into a more homogeneous mixture on a long enough time scale. You can break anything down in water. But while uh, Venus is quite good at um, creating uh, connections and attachments in, say, Taurus with objects or material things, uh, as well as, as people, um, and sort of fixing and stabilizing the connections with uh, the desirable things in Taurus, as well as initiating and seeking out new connections and forming unions in Libra. In Pisces, those connections are a little different. Um, Venus and Taurus can get a little bit too attached and a little too possessive uh, of those things which have been um, brought into her sphere, if you will. The tendency to hold on to what has been collected or gained in Taurus is very strong and can become, uh, turn into greed, you know, um, or inordinate amount of, of lust even. Uh, in Libra, where the focus is very strongly on on the other, you know, Venus is very good at creating those connections, right? Facilitating harmonious relations, relations. but the uh, <clears throat> tendency can be to get a little too attached to those relationships. But in Pisces, uh, we're dealing with mutable water, changeable, movable, adaptable water. So Venus is quite good at creating deep, nurturing, loving connections. In Pisces, we come to an understanding that that all experience is transitory, that no state is permanent, and we learn to find a sort of flow and equilibrium. And we learn that all things are always sort of transitioning into a different state of being at all times and kind of recombining in different ways, right? That when you're looking at things through the uh, the Jupiterian big picture lens of Pisces, you know, we learn that we're all uh, we're all stardust, right? That you know, we all um, are composed of atoms and molecules that were formed in the in the hearts of stars, and that the uh, the matter that uh, comprises our bodies will ultimately uh, be dispersed and reintegrated into the whole of existence, right? But it's the uh, the soul, <clears throat> the spirit that that endures. So Venus uh, in Pisces, again, can be very um, deeply connected, but not necessarily deeply attached or overly attached. She learns to find uh, beauty in the ever-changing moment, as all too often uh, our pleasure and joy is thwarted in many ways by our inability to disentangle uh, our experience from the past or to accept uh, the inevitable passing of that moment. You know, it's hard to to enjoy life when you're constantly worrying about death, right? It's actually an easy way to uh, suck the joy out of your life. It's also hard to really enjoy, difficult to enjoy close relationships or partnerships or camaraderie with uh, loved ones when, uh, when you're afraid um, of abandonment or rejection. It's also hard to accept accept and appreciate people for who they are and who they might become when we're overly attached to uh, a version of them that equates to the uh, the continuity of a relationship as sometimes those uh, natural changes that people go through necessitate the the ending of certain connections and the beginning of of different ones as Pisces is a sign that's more concerned with, the deeper underlying truth of things than it is concerned with the specific uh, material incarnation of things. Uh, Venus is both soft enough and adaptable and connective to maintain relationships through many different changes in material circumstances, um, as well as able to release connections which are no longer... Um, resonant with the uh, the truth of who people are uh, at any given time. 
This also makes Venus um, a lot more, say, tolerant of uh, deviations from a sort of ideal or, you know, imperfections because it's, you know, just more interested in what's underneath, what's in somebody's soul, as opposed to, say, um, Venus in Virgo, which is the sign of Venus's fall. Venus in Virgo will tend to get a little hung up on imperfection, has a hard time uh, accepting or loving uh, themselves. Um, they fail to um, measure up to sort of ideal of perfection. Um, and sometimes that can translate into uh, expectations of, of others, especially those whom they're in close personal relationships with. Venus in Pisces hits that sort of sweet spot where she can easily accept uh, her own desires and the desires of others without necessarily becoming hung up on the specifics of how those desires are met. So she actually tends to facilitate uh, the fulfillment of those desires much more easily and readily <clears throat> than they uh, would be when we're overly attached to the specific ways uh, or the, the details of how how those things come about. I often like to think about um, Venus and Pisces, the idea of unconditional love, which I think sometimes gets misunderstood. Or often uh, what is associated with the idea of unconditional love is that two people will unconditionally stay together um, or, you know, tolerate uh, misbehaviors of, of different kinds. Um, and sort of stick with somebody regardless. Uh, it's not really what Venus and Pisces is about. Um, she can be certainly, certainly likely to be tolerant of a lot of things that maybe some people would call misbehaviors <laughs> uh, in others, in some cases. But usually, it's because uh, they're less concerned about the details, um, less concerned about things which would uh, make other people feel threatened. It's ultimately more interested in facilitating mutual joy and happiness, as well as feel, uh, facilitating sort of personal growth and evolution um, for themselves, as well as, you know, those with whom they are connected to. So as long as like the underlying, um, as long as the, the connection is, is fulfilling, you know, uh, in the long, broader term, yeah, Venus and Pisces will tolerate a lot, <laughs> but that's what's uh, what, what's great about Venus and Pisces is that it's not so attached that it will stay in a really negative, shitty situation most of the time. Um, you know, Venus and Pisces is usually good at identifying when a connection, you know, needs to end because there's a sort of uh, faith that love and beauty and all that stuff can be found <laughs> in the world because. The Piscean Sea, there are certainly plenty, plenty of fish. Um, but also, uh, Venus doesn't necessarily, Venus and Pisces doesn't necessarily need the person to be there uh, to love them, right? <laughs> it's uh, that idea of unconditional love is more of a, a love that transcends the uh, boundaries of the physical, right? And because there is a little bit of um, a tendency to romanticize and idealize in a, a different way than maybe Virgo, very different way. Um, you know, it may find it easier to love somebody when um, they're not actually around or in their lives anymore. Uh, actually, I uh, think about uh, Edgar Allan Poe a lot when I think about Venus and Pisces, even though he wasn't, um, it was kind of a complicated version. He had a uh, moon, Venus, uh, Pluto, and Jupiter conjunction in, um, in Pisces. And it's kind of squared by Saturn in Sagittarius. But Pluto did seem to, to warp warp it quite a bit or take it to, to the extreme. But um, he is, as you may know, uh, was a very idealistic, uh, romantic type. Um, you know, lived through a lot of uh, tragic losses of, of women. Particularly his, his mother uh, died at a young age. Uh, I think he was so young, actually, like three or so, that he likely didn't actually have any real memories of his mother, but he idealized her nonetheless. And then his uh, wife, with whom by all accounts, he had a really like beautiful like relationship with, uh, she died pretty young of tuberculosis. 
he was definitely devastated and didn't really let go of that connection, but continued to idealize her um, from the grave. And it shows up a lot in his poetry, like this kind of uh, this idea of love that transcends death and in to some degree of death being a, a sort of a romanticized unification in and of itself. I mean, uh, I think Pluto definitely took it to another level, but you get the sense of, of some of the flavor there, <laughs> uh, which is really, you know, a beautiful thing, even without taken to uh, being taken to the, the gothy extremes that Edgar Allan Poe did. Uh, it, it's um, a really great Venus for all, uh, all sorts of Venusian things. Um, great for poetry, great for art. And while, you know, Pisces isn't always uh, as interested or attached to the material manifestation of things or about, you know, like wealth and luxury, uh, very good at, at drawing in those things and not just drawing in those things, but like establishing a good relationship with things. Like most of the time, Venus and Pisces, if it, you know, wins the lottery, uh, probably not going to be one of those stories of the person going crazy and buying a bunch of boats and houses and developing a big drug habit and running out of money. Um, after, you know, three or four years, uh, the relationship's falling apart. Venus and Pisces, I think, would uh, not be, would not have their world sort of turned upside down by an influx of uh, material wealth. Uh, you know, again, it's that just the right amount of attachment, usually, and the ability to to enjoy, take pleasure in things, and then, you know, let them go in their proper time. So, you know, Venus and Pisces, generally good for, uh, generally good time for cultivating uh, beauty within uh, a project or within yourself that is uh, not overdone and tends to sort of uh, generate or emanate from the essence of it rather than through the sort of precise geometry of a thing. I'd say it's a good time for adding sort of soft touches to things, just the right touch to something that makes it sort of pop and gives it uh, a little bit of that that glamour that sort of a uh, natural glamour that almost effortless kind of glamour you know if you're putting a lot of effort into it or too much effort into it you're not really working with venus and pisces you know subtle touches feel your way into it and not getting uh hung up on the details as ultimately with venus and pisces it's more about um you know, what's within and what's underlying the thing or the person, you know, really nice for, I would say, self-development, accepting um, imperfection within yourself and within others, forgiving yourself for mistakes um, or imperfections, as well as maybe coming to terms with uh, relationships that are no longer present in your life, maybe coming to um, appreciate the beauty of the time and place of that particular relationship or period in your life and not um, letting its status as a past event uh, interfere with your ability to to appreciate and find joy in it. Again, really good for, for grieving loss. Um, I think any work that has to do with releasing uh, anger or grief or resentment over the absence of a person or thing in your your life uh, that you know is interfering interfering with your ability to to move on as well as um maybe sort of recognize or take the the lessons or the sort of fruits of that relationship with you venus will definitely support that uh though um there will be a, a little bit of challenge with mars unfortunately uh Venus is going to be square Mars uh, by sign, you know, throughout the duration of her stay in Pisces, unfortunately, which you know, we'll talk a little bit more about in detail next week. Um, probably makes uh, specific elections or the creation of like talismans or anything with this particular Venus a little more problematic. Um, you might be able to get something out of her. <laughs> uh, Maybe early on, while she's still in the first uh, degree or two, and maybe towards the end. But overall, uh, you should still be able to get a lot out of um, 
working with Venus in a, a less um, or working with Venus in a more personal or internal way, probably get uh, a bit more out of her going that route. <clears throat> but we'll talk more about that next week. Uh, at minimum, we'll at least have a, a really pleasant Friday. But for sake of time, we should start talking about the other main event this week, and that would be uh, our Saturn's uh, helical setting. Uh, basically on Sunday, the 29th, that will be the last day that Saturn will be visible in the night sky. You might be able to catch Saturn uh, on the horizon just a little after sunset, but essentially Saturn is a, about to disappear for a while under the beams of the sun. And this represents really the closing out of Saturn's uh, more or less annual cycle with the sun or synodic cycle. <clears throat> as this essentially represents a sort of new moon for Saturn, or, or a new Saturn, if you will, uh, with the, the retrograde and the opposition with the sun being a, maybe a full Saturn, <clears throat> sort of a culmination of, of Saturnian events. <laughs> uh, this is a wrapping up and a closing out of many Saturnian works. And this one comes at a rather interesting time with Saturn uh, about to depart from Aquarius. In fact, it seems to resonate uh, quite a bit with a lot of what we talked about last week with this idea of sort of coming to terms with, uh, you know, the reality of one's uh, circumstances and the, you know, the nature of <clears throat> the obligations and circumstances, you know, that bind you to a circumstance, uh, that bind you to a situation that you maybe find to be a source of uh, limitation um, in terms of, of your happiness, perhaps, or really maybe keeping you from moving on to a more uh, expansive and self-actualized, perhaps, version of your life. Um, yeah, the Saturn disappears from view in the sky. <clears throat> it moves from, becomes, you know, less visible in a material sense in the world. It becomes more uh, of an internal experience. This is where you know we get um, we get to confront or be confronted with maybe the the consequences of our actions or of the structure uh, of our lives as they have been tended to or neglected uh, up to this time, where we sort of uh, assess you know our decisions <clears throat> or assess things as they are and begin to figure out what changes need to be made or what um, maybe new structures need to be put in place in the future. And these are not going to be things that are going to be built overnight. You know, these are Saturnian things. And Saturnian works are the kind that take place over long periods of time and through a considerable amount of effort. <laughs> and um, what's a little different about this one, this particular Sun-Saturn, conjunction, which has been the case uh, with all of them for the past, what, six years, <laughs> um, is that normally when Saturn, uh, when the sun comes into a conjunction with a planet, uh, it sort of breaks it down, purifies it, you know, burns it up <laughs> and uh, sort of distills the planet down to its essence um, uh, so that we can sort of begin a new cycle with that planet, um, carrying over, you know, maybe the, the best or the sort of distilled version into the next phase, but hopefully leaving behind that which is no longer necessary. But in this case, um, Saturn is in one of its own signs in Aquarius. So traditionally it's said to be sort of in its chariot. It has like a little canopy to protect it from the fiery rays of the sun, right? So Saturn isn't necessarily being broken down uh, on quite the same level. This one's going to be a little more about uh, those structures which cannot be broken down, maybe, by our, our individual efforts alone. Um, some of those structures may require a more kind of collective will, if you will, to uh, be reformed or reshaped. <clears throat> we may be confronted with you know, things that uh, with the limitations that we're just going to have to work within, you know, 
as uh, the sun approaches Saturn, you know, Saturn is entering the uh, the palace of the sun in, in a sense. But this is a little more like the king kind of coming to Saturn <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, Saturn is going to be maybe coaching or or lecturing uh, the sun <laughs> a little more than the other way around, as the sun is uh, not only in one of Saturn's signs with Saturn, so, you know, being received by Saturn in his home, but it's also a sign where the sun is traditionally in uh, its detriment or antithesis. It's uh, opposite its home, uh, opposite Leo. So, you know, we may be uh, having to digest or integrate some, uh, what might be for some, you know, harsher realities, you know, or at least not as, um, not particularly friendly or pleasant ones always, you know, the, the sun and Saturn aren't, aren't necessarily friends. Uh, they're kind of, uh, they're very much opposites in many ways. And yet they rep both represent um, different kinds of authority, it's the sort of uh, divine personal authority of the sun. And then there's the sort of natural, or rather um, the authority which is derived from or those things which uh, are set into being um, by things outside of ourselves. You know, it's not personal authority. It's authority derived from greater bodies than ourselves <laughs> the collection of bodies you know the sun's like a king it's a monarch you know it's a uh, autocratic in nature while saturn you know it's a little more democratic in, in a sense it's uh it is the the limit of the sun's authority <laughs> it's uh you know what what limits the power of a king of uh, people's willingness to obey the king's rules right so if people don't want to obey uh, a king anymore, often they'll uh, elect leaders whose power is checked uh, in a sense, perhaps by something like a constitution or, you know, their power is derived not from uh, birthright, but by having earned it one way or, the, or another uh, by doing the work of convincing people that they're worthy of, of authority. So, you know, why we... Bleh. Why we may be able to still retain or discover some of our personal will and authority uh, through Jupiter in Aries, we still have to do it through the sort of uh, moralizing and, and moder moderating nature of, of Jupiter. Jupiter's not so much a king uh, as a sort of teacher or, or guru. You know, it's um, going to speak more to the responsible uh responsible and altruistic uh merits of being a fully individuated and, and autonomous being while perhaps still respecting um the rights and wills of other autonomous beings um i don't think that right now is a particular particular particularly strong period for autocratic or, or monarchical authority I imagine a, a lot of uh, structures and institutions based around those kinds of types of authority are likely to be confronted uh, with the the limits uh, of what they can do um, and will likely have to be brought into some sort of reluctant and maybe humbling accord with some higher, more structural principle <laughs> that lies outside of themselves. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, what's interesting about this little period here. Um, I'll go ahead and pull up the, the chart <clears throat> as uh, <clears throat> geez, as uh, the Saturn is going to disappear from the sky. We are not going to see Saturn again until just before Saturn departs from Aquarius for good. Uh, there we go. Uh, as the sun gets closer to Saturn, as we get closer to that conjunction, Saturn is actually going to be moving uh, at top Saturn speed. As you can imagine, um, the sun sort of standing between us and Saturn, we're sort of getting the, the speed of the Earth um, and its rotation around the sun uh, sort of added to Saturn's speed, at least from our perspective. 
it's sort of a weird thing to explain. But anyway, we, we get that Kazemi of the Sun and Saturn, February 16th, which we'll talk more about around then. But as the Sun separates from that conjunction, uh, we still can't see Saturn. Still can't see Saturn. But it will make its helical rise right around here, right around uh, March 6th. So you got to get a good 15 degrees or so in order for Saturn to become visible again. And Saturn will be at 29 degrees, 15 minutes of Aquarius. So uh, about a day, two days of visible Saturn in Aquarius um, before it pops into to Pisces. So rather interesting wrap up. And I would think especially for those having um, their Saturn return, those born with Saturn in Aquarius natally, this is an interesting opportunity to really get clear insights on what your Saturn return was about. Even those um, who aren't having their Saturn returns, you know, Saturn just transited one of the houses in your chart. So, you know, it's the completion or end of a period of reality checks and stress testing, perhaps, or a period of limitations and restriction in a certain area of your life. So this is kind of an opportunity to get really clear on you know what your role was in all of it and maybe what uh wasn't really under your control you know like saturn does tend to reward responsibility and discipline and you know grinding away at, at something uh in the long term but saturn also reminds and teaches us that you know we're not gods uh, we there are absolute limits to our power to create change both in the world and within our lives and there's a need to sort of uh, humbly accept some of those limitations um there are absolute limitations to who you can be and what you can do in this lifetime it's the sad saturnian truth but it is the truth nonetheless um however you know those aren't always uh the result of personal defects or weaknesses, you know, sometimes it's just the circumstances of the world, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, while not uh, completely pleasant to acknowledge your lack of supreme power over everything, uh, also eliminates some of your responsibility <laughs> in, in everything too, you know, there can be a great deal of relief that comes with humility and accepting those things that are outside of our control and accepting the limitations of our power and not making our self responsible for, for everything or for being everything that we think we need to be. Right. And, you know, again, just to reiterate, uh, while there are, you know, things that you probably won't be able to change in this lifetime, um, some things will just take a while. And if you can make peace with that sort of acclimate to the, uh, the, Saturnian pace of of things and during this final phase of Saturn and Aquarius I think you'll be very well positioned to make uh more effectual and enduring changes as Saturn uh moves on into Pisces and moves out of of being in uh, any major form of dignity for about what I'm about 20 years, maybe, until Saturn gets into Libra. So, while it may not be pleasant, you know, absorb some Saturnian lessons while they're they're on offer, especially if you don't have um, a particularly, you know, strong Saturn in your natal chart. Uh, Saturn's power to not just impose, but also reveal limitations uh, will not be nearly as strong as it is now for uh, quite a time to come. So you you will have to sort of carry that, um, those lessons with you. Because Saturn won't be dishing them out uh, quite in as quite of a archetypally clean and pure way. Which, uh, on the one hand, thank God, like, that's, could use a break, but there is utility and value um, in sort of swallowing those bitter pills. So with that, let's move on <clears throat> and run through our uh, our week to week, our day to day, rather. So Monday, we have the day of the moon, 
and the first half of the day, the moon will be hanging with Saturn, slightly smoothed over by Venus. Um, however, Saturn, I think, is going to be the dominant force uh, and influence on the moon during the first half of the day. But around noon, uh, Eastern Standard Time, the moon will slip into Pisces, which while in many ways more pleasant overall for the moon, certainly more at home and, and a water sign like Pisces, the moon will be applying to a square with Mars. Um, so while I would definitely say maybe an uptick in energy during the second half of the day, uh, we're sort of moving through uh, gloomy skies, moving from gloomy skies to uh, a little bit of thunder and lightning, perhaps. I'm going to call uh, Monday overall stormy. <laughs> It's, it's um, not necessarily a comfortable, easy Monday, but um, you're able to work with work with the energy. Today, uh, you might be able to be pretty productive, especially when we move into moon, Mars territory. Uh, activity, physical activity tends to, to be sort of best way to work with that. So try to get up and move around a little bit, especially if you, especially if you have a more sedentary lifestyle or job. Uh, otherwise, it's going to tend to bubble up a little more uh, as anxiety, which is sort of nervous tension. And I'm going to skip the planetary nights this week because I am tired and rather hungry. Uh, and so we move into Tuesday, day of Mars. And uh, Mars is not moving all that fast just yet. What are we at? Mars is moving about seven or eight minutes a day about now. So you know, maybe still feeling a little sluggish, maybe a little frustrated with the pace of things, um, but you might be able to work with Mars uh, being conjunct fixed our Aldebaran, um, which is quite good for maintaining um, uh, focus and sort of discipline through obstacles. Uh, there's a lot of perseverance with Aldebaran and like an ability to make steady progress towards a desired goal. So even if things aren't moving fast, just plow away. <laughs> It'll be supported. Whatever speed you can go at. You know, the sun uh, in Aquarius is starting to apply to a trine with Mars, which does add a little, you know, energy, a little, little bit of solar energy to Mars, a um, little bit more direction, a little bit more uh, of a easy identification with those tasks which just need to get done. Uh, Ma, Jupiter is also still in a, a wide but relevant sextile with Mars. So I'm actually going to go ahead and give Tuesday uh, maybe a cloudy with maybe little pockets of sunshine uh, throughout the day. And then moving into Wednesday, uh, day of Mercury. So what's Mercury doing? Uh, still coming off of its retrograde from last week. And it's moving... Uh, a little bit more than half of a degree a day, it's starting to pick up speed. Certainly not fast by Mercury standards, but um, starting to, to move forward. Mercury's also not um, under the beams or anything. Mercury spends a lot of time <clears throat> not being visible in the sky. So even if Mercury's moving slow, I tend to like those periods, uh, which we can actually see Mercury. So it's not so wrapped up in in the subjective mind usually it's a good time to think things through without you know as many of our subjective biases biases <laughs> sort of gumming up the works it's a little easier to just focus on stuff and, and get out of your own head and into you know whatever project you're you're working on uh mercury is a little lonely really only has like a wide square with Jupiter and no, it doesn't look like any aspects with the moon coming to completion today either. So uh, I'm going to call Wednesday overcast, but um, at least not disrupted by any intemperate weather uh, of any kind. Sort of a slow and quiet day. And then... Um, Thursday. Thursday is kind of nice. <clears throat> Jupiter is a co-presence with the, the moon. The moon is starting to separate. And the sun is just coming off the sextile. 
with Jupiter, but generally uh, I like that Jupiter has some connection with the luminaries. It helps uh, make Jupiter feel a little more real, a little more felt in our actual lives. So I'm going to give uh, Jupiter a, a mostly sunny, or give Thursday a, a mostly sunny. Should be feeling um, a little peppier, a little, a little more optimistic, at least uh, relative to, <laughs> to the rest of the week. Save for Friday, because Friday we get uh, the day of Venus with Venus freshly in Pisces, and really wide enough, um, far enough away from the square with Mars <laughs> to get to enjoy uh, Venus, you know, mostly for her own sake. Without too much Mars interference, and we may, well, we won't quite get it before the sun goes down. At least not. Should I take that back? Uh, probably on the west coast, you should be get uh, be able to get a little bit of the Venus uh, sextile, the Moon in Taurus, towards the the end of the day before the sun goes down, which helps uh, Venus be come a little more felt embodied and maybe show up in some pleasant events in our, our lives, especially with the, the reception between the moon and Venus, uh, Venus being the, the ruler of Taurus. And while the moon, you know, may not um, be the most um, stable or unpolluted vessel for our Venusian works, given uh, the co-presence with the North Node and Uranus and Taurus, um, I think we got to take our, take what we can get when we get it. So, you know, go out for drinks, get a massage, do something nice for yourself. This is one of the nicest Fridays that we have had in a while. So take it in. Overall, really nice day for Venusian things. Uh, I'm going to give it a... I'm just going to give it a sunny. It's sunny. A sunny Venus Friday. Maybe slightly windy, we'll say. Uh, and then... Saturday, day of Saturn. <clears throat> How's the Saturn still at, at Aquarius? Uh, at 25 Aquarius. Uh, factor in that this is probably the last Saturn day where Saturn will be very visible, uh, will still be visible in the sky, not under the sun's beams. So, but overall, I would say as far as Saturdays go, uh, if you got your shit done this week, enjoy the day. Saturn will leave you be if <laughs> if you've earned your your right to to relax on Saturday. But I would say Saturnian works definitely uh, supported. If you have any that you want to, you have any specifically in mind that you have planned <clears throat> for Saturday. Oh, geez, <clears throat> for Saturday. Um, finally Sunday, day of the sun. Sun is in Aquarius, uh, in a tight trine with Mars, applying to it rather, and preparing to swallow, <laughs> try to try and fail to swallow the sun, uh, Saturn, or perhaps uh, preparing for its audience with uh, like the King of Winterfell or something. Um, so, uh, you know, not necessarily the greatest of solar days, um, the sun being very closely associated with malefics um, on this particular Sunday. However, Sun-Mars trines are pretty useful. They're usually good. Uh, it's good for getting shit done. Sun and Mars, uh, you know, they they have a lot in common when they're well disposed to each other. With the sun being kind of cooled down in Aquarius, you know, Mars might help, help uh, heat things up a little bit before we have uh, Sun Saturn for the next few weeks. Sun Mars, you know, can be its own kind of problems, um, but they are the problems that come from fire and heat <clears throat> and too much activity. While Sun Saturn, you know, it's heavier, darker, colder, a little more dour. <laughs> um, so if you have uh, some last minute shit to get done <laughs> in hopes of. Uh, uh, to potentially, um, if you have some incomplete tasks uh, that you think Saturn might give you some shit for later on, I would say Sunday is a good day to do those things which must be done. You may have a little more energy to do them. Uh, it's kind of nice that Mercury is also trying Uranus. 
the same time. While they're not necessarily directly affecting each other, uh, Mercury does rule Mars, so huh. there's uh, definitely a increase in, in speed and probably energy levels on Sunday, uh, especially because we will have entered the waxing square of the moon uh, over here in Taurus, which is generally uh, that second quarter moon is uh, more energetic, tends to have maybe the fastest pace of the fastest sort of development uh, of events that you'll tend to find during the moon's cycle. And with that, we will call it a week. And as always, you can book a reading with me at kylepierceastrologer.com. And if you're interested in learning about the decans of the Zodiac, we would love it if you joined us at the Three of Wands Discord channel for our uh, three times a month <clears throat> for our uh, decanly meetings, um, three Tuesdays a month at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we talk about the decans, right? Uh, specifically, we'll be going over this Tuesday, uh, the first decan of Aquarius. So if you want to learn more about first decan of Aquarius, you have planets in the first decan of Aquarius, you want to get the scoop, we'd love to have you. And if you uh, enjoyed the podcast, uh, or if you're watching on YouTube, you know, leave a review, leave a comment, like, subscribe, uh, give us all five of your stars. It seriously helps a lot, and it's really easy to do. So do it. Do it, guys. Um, yeah, thanks so much for listening. See you next week. And if you have a question you would like to hear answered on Astrology Hotline, shoot us an email at, at astrologyhotlinepod at gmail.com. 